The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Doesn't really matter what the official title is. Uh, hi, thanks for coming on Saturday. Uh, maybe some of you had better things to do, so I appreciate you being here. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a smallish room, and uh, I'm a fan of sort of informal presentations, which is why I don't have a deck. Uh, I tend not to believe in them, especially in a small room. Uh, and I also don't really like talking to people who sort of, uh, you know, I don't understand what they're here for, and in a room this small, um, I think it's uh, okay for me to ask questions of you just as it's okay of you to ask questions of me. And I've got a sort of presentation in my head that I'll, I'll, I'll give bits and pieces of it if it's appropriate. Uh, and if no one has any pressing questions, I can always just wander through. But to me, it's sort of much more interesting to hear about what you're doing with cloud, if anything. Because uh, it seems to me, there you go, right, zero, right? Um, and one of the things that I don't like doing is coming up and saying, the future is cloud, blah, 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 when no one is necessarily do anything, doing anything about it or don't know why they should uh, and sort of don't know where to get started. Uh, and there's really no one-size-fits-all deck for that. So uh, let me start with some questions and maybe a show of hands, if that's OK. Uh, how many of you use Linux here at Southeast Linux Fest? Good, good start. Uh, how many of you uh, are sysadmins who are responsible for some number of production systems? Okay, a significant number, so that, that's good. That means I'll have some important things to say to you. Uh, how many are doing any of that stuff on the public cloud, uh, i.e. Amazon or somewhere else at this point? A much smaller number, interesting. Uh, and, and, you know, what we see, right? That's, that's what we see. Um, people whose job it is to uh, manage and administer enterprise systems are sort of caught in this thing I like to call the sysadmin's lament, right? So uh, let me share with you uh, uh, the sysadmin's lament as I see it. Um, being a sysadmin is a hard job because you have to deal with users all day, every day, and they have requests, and some of them are reasonable, and many of them are unreasonable, uh, and you have to fulfill them all just the same. Uh, and so in order to do that, uh, IT departments have come up over the years with lots of interesting hurdles, uh, not necessarily to prevent people from getting the services they need, but to make sure that IT is properly protected from all of the people who come in and ask for a production server two days before they need it ready, right? Uh, what? They still do. Of course they still do. They always will, right? That's the nature of users. They want what they want when they want it. Uh, and they don't think about things like, you know, is there a server in the back room that can accommodate this and what happens when, you know, the, the load goes to 20 at 3 in the morning. It's not user's job to think about that. It's a sysadmin's job to think about that, right? So in the enterprise, uh, there are all kinds of uh, change request mechanisms and, uh, you know, requisition forms. Um, and... Uh, even the most effective organizations are now finding themselves in the position where there's a developer who has a perfectly reasonable request to get a box set up now for some Skunk Works project that they're working on that they think can change the company and do something incredibly cool. Um, and rather than go through what may be a month-long process to get some VM or dedicated system or something set aside for them, they are willing now to do this, right? Take out a credit card and go set that system up on Amazon or someplace else, but mostly Amazon, right now in 15 minutes, right? And if you know what you're doing, it's more like two minutes to set up your own uh, Amazon uh, instance, right? And they come and they go all the way down to a micro instance that's free for the first year. So now, a lot of people don't even have to pull out the credit card for that first AMI. They just, they just set it up for free. All the way up to great big things that 
you know, have uh, essentially dedicated machines. Um, and it's this self-service nature of the way Amazon works uh, that is, you know, scaring the hell out of a lot of sysadmins right now, and for good reason, right? Um, traditional IT organizations tend to think in terms of command and control of those resources, and the cloud model really, really makes that challenging, right? Uh, so we call this the public cloud. Uh, I work for a company called Eucalyptus. What we do is private cloud, uh, and I don't want this to be too much of a product pitch, but to a certain degree I can't help it. So if that offends you, I don't mind if you leave for the door. Uh, you know, uh, David, if you get tired of hearing, David is uh, one of my competitors at CloudStack. He talked this morning, so uh, if you get tired of hearing me, just feel free to, or throw things, uh, you know. Um, we're both open source though, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna share some code maybe. We need to talk to you about our UI. We got problems, by the way. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, because we don't care about the UI so much, we care about the API. So all of our efforts go into the API, and then everyone says, CloudStack's really pretty. So um, competition, open source, yay. Uh, yes, co-opetition, that's right. So, so we're now in a place where a bunch of enterprises, and this is most of the people who come to us, a lot of the people come to us with the sysadmins lament. They say either they're, and mostly it's the head of the IT department, they're coming to us and saying, we would really like some way of taking all of these workloads that have gone rogue out in the cloud and pull those back in. Could you help us with that, please? So that's what we do. My company, Eucalyptus Systems, well, it's not my company, it's uh, our company. Uh, and the CEO is Martin Mikos, who is the former CEO of MySQL. Uh, our company provides private, open source, infrastructure as a, a, a service software uh, so that you can set up your own cloud. And the intent is to make it look just like Amazon, as much like Amazon as possible, at least on the back end, right? All of the APIs and so forth. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, that uh, and sort of what private cloud means and what hybrid cloud means, right? That's the direction I'm going here. Also, if there's any questions at any point, feel free, or if you disagree or anything at all, just feel free to holler. Like I really uh, welcome that. Uh, it's a funny thing. Everyone in the enterprise world is now very interested in cloud, mostly vendors, right? Vendors are really interested in talking about cloud. Cloud, 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 they can cloud your cloud and they can put some cloud on top of your cloud. Or they can take their virtualization, virtualization, virtualization and make it cloud. Or they can take their systems management tool and cloudify your management of systems in the cloud, right? Uh, which, you know, that's, there's good reasons for that, right? Amazon is growing explosively and they're pretty much proving the viability of that model and it's not like they're slowing down. So companies have good reason to do that. But a lot of companies, especially some large enterprise companies in the virtualization space that I don't necessarily have to name, uh, they sort of, they want, to f they, they want you to fear the public cloud. They want you to fear the public cloud because the public cloud is scary, right? Uh, they, they, they have your data. You have no idea where that data might be. You have no idea who might have access to that data. It's in the public cloud. God only knows where it is. Well, I mean, the same thing is true at any large data center, but that doesn't stop them from using data centers, right? And the fact is that the people who are handling security at Amazon or other large cloud vendors probably have more and better security folks paying attention to the key questions than they do in their or own organizations, right? So I think one of the things that distinguishes uh, Eucalyptus as a company uh, is that we sort of rely upon you to use the public cloud, right? Because our entire value proposition is that you should use Amazon for as much as you can, and we know perfectly well that there are going to be times when Amazon just isn't right for you. And it's not because the cloud is scary, it's because there are legitimate uses for the public cloud and the private cloud. There are some things you don't want out there. There are a lot of things you do. And the key is to make sure that when you're managing all of these systems in these two places, the, the tools and the systems and the processes that you're using on both sides 
are as much alike as they can possibly be, and the workload of managing both of those sets of systems is as low as it can possibly be. Okay? You're starting to hear people talk about hybrid cloud. That's what they mean. Right? Uh, does that make sense? Have people heard the term hybrid cloud? So maybe not. Maybe this is something that's happening in, in, in vendor land primarily. But, right, but we can assure you, us vendors, we can assure you this is the direction that things are going, right? So, um, so I saw a couple of hands go up for people who are using uh, Amazon for actual something. Who are those people again? Right, so, if, if, so for what? Shout it out. What do you use, what do you use it for? What, what workloads? Uh-huh. Is there anything except the LAMP stacks, by the way? Not currently, but I used it for a Rails app for a year or two. So does Rails count as a LAMP stack? It's, pretty it's a ramp stack. <laughs> so it's a <laughs> and it comes from Japan, so, uh, well, that's terrible. Ruby, Japan, that's, oh, wow. I'm, I'm ashamed that my brain even went there, but, yeah, so the ramp stack. Um, so yes, and that's exactly right. And everyone is running a LAMP stack. How many people saw the Azure announcement yesterday? Or maybe it was Thursday. Azure? Yeah, what is Azure doing? Tell us. Adding the Linux support, right? Mostly adding LAMP stack supports of various kinds. So, and this is the funny thing. It, you know, and it's sort, of, it's sort of weird coming to an open source convention conference of any kind these days, you know, and, and you know, and frankly, the numbers are smaller than they used to be. And I think one of the reasons the numbers are smaller is that open source basically kind of won, right? The kind of fun battley days are sort of open, over, right? Open source and Linux are so commonplace now that in order to compete in the cloud world, in the public cloud world, Microsoft Azure has no choice but to make Linux stacks available because that's what customers are paying for. And Microsoft, being in the business to make money, says, all right, we will make LAMP stacks available and we'll figure out how to make money on it, right? I mean, that's, uh, you know, I was doing these conferences 10 years ago. I don't think, you know, we may have talked about that, but I don't really think we ever imagined that, that this is where we'd end up, right? Uh, all right, so enough of that. Uh, virtualization. How many people are using virtualization in your environments? And of the, so that's almost all of you, uh, and, and almost a complete overlap with the, with the, with the folks who uh, uh, are sysadmins. Uh, is there anyone who's a sysadmin for serious numbers of boxes that doesn't use virtualization in your environment? No, right. So 100% overlap between real sysadmins and people using virtualization. How many of you are using open source virtualization? And how many of you are using VMware? Okay, so that's a pretty even split and also pretty representative. Um, so uh, one of the value propositions of, of Eucalyptus, and I believe other uh, cloud platforms to be, to be clear as well, uh, is the ability to put a management layer, a self-service management layer, on top of all of that virtualization stuff, right? So how many people who are using VMware are using vCloud Director? You're about to? You wish to talk. So you should reconsider that. It's just my, I mean, you know. I mean, if there are any VMware salespeople in the audience, I'm sorry, but we should, we, you should consider that, right? Because um, they say they're in the cloud business, but they're not. They're in the virtualization business, and they're different, right? And one of the key differences is that in a cloud environment, you have heterogeneous environments to deal with, right? Is VMware the only virtualization stack you run? Are you happy with that? For now, exactly, for now, right? And I think that as VMware sort of, you know, sees more competition, they're going to be tightening those screws to do what they can to make sure that people are single uh, vendor shops, right? Um, and so when we go to customers, one of the things we pitch is you don't want to care what kind of virtualization stack you're running under, underneath, right? If you, can't, if, if you don't have some combination of libraries like libvirt to manage everything on the open source site, like Zen and KVM and so forth, and whatever tools VMware has to expose their API, once you have these API tools, what you really want is a layer on top of that that can manage all of that, excuse me, in, uh, in the same kind of self-service way 
that the cloud allows you to, to manage that stuff with. Because that's going to be one of your requirements, sysadmins. If it's not today, it will be, right? Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. Maybe your bulwarks of process are going to hold the hordes at bay for a while. But at some point, the majority of people in this space are going to come to expect self-service virtualized machines on demand everywhere. Because, they, because the smart ones know that they can already get that now just by avoiding you, right? and putting, paying a few bucks out of their own pocket. Um, so when we talk to VMware folks, uh, you know, we are sure to mention that there's a difference between virtualization and cloud, right? Uh, and so yes, we should, we should talk. Um, any questions at all? Because if not, I'm just going to start telling stories. Yes? Which providers were those? Uh, the one, I, one that sticks in my mind is Terramark, but they got like five or six others. Were any of them Amazon? No. Right. So, and this is interesting, right? And this is, and so you can see here where the cloud wars are going, right? Because it's all about the API. And the thing that you said in there that stood out is that what they're pitching is 100% API compatibility within this family of offerings, right? And that family of offerings is essentially defined by API fidelity, right? So that's one of the reasons that when Eucalyptus was founded, uh, so okay, this isn't fair. This is, this is looking back historically. But it was a really good guess at the time, right? Because really there was only one public cloud, essentially, and it was Amazon that exposed any management APIs in public when Eucalyptus started as a project at UCSB in 2007. And so that was it, and they said, that's what a public cloud looks like, so we'll just take that API. Did they imagine that the world would come when there were lots of competing projects with different APIs? Probably not. They saw one and they went with it. But in that time, there have been many other projects that are trying to set up competitive APIs so that they can use that API as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as a key part of the value proposition, right? And that moving of workloads back and forth. We like to claim at Eucalyptus that we are the best at moving workloads back and forth between us and Amazon. And we deliberately don't focus on those other players because we feel like Amazon is the strongest, we feel like Amazon has the biggest lead, and we feel like they're going to continue to have the biggest lead, and we're going to keep up with them as best as we can by running full speed and still not being even close, <laughs> right? Um, Earlier this year, we signed a deal with Amazon uh, around those APIs uh, and basically an agreement that we would work together to make sure that our API fidelity was as close as possible to Amazon, uh, which is a big deal for us. And the reason that was a big deal is because it was Amazon implicitly admitting that on-premise cloud, they don't like to call it private cloud, they call it on-premise cloud, they admitted that on-premise cloud was a thing, right? For the longest time, Amazon wouldn't really even admit that on-premise cloud was a thing. Now they agree that it's a thing, and it's a thing you should pay attention to, and it's a thing that you should probably seek to make sure is compatible with uh, the, the cloud that they want you to use, which is the Amazon cloud. Uh, what, 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 so uh, virtualization folks, what do you use, what tools do you use to manage your, your, your machines? Like are you, how are you managing your virtual machine stacks now. Puppet, Chef, various tools, anyone? Installing them one at a time? <laughs> really? Nothing. Not installing one at a time. Installing one at a time. Yeah. yeah. I, I, have, I have automation from a guest. And not from Interesting. Oh, thanks for the mic. Say that again into the mic. Are you recording this, by the way? Yeah. Uh, currently, we're doing things one at a time. Uh, right. And I have Personally, I have automation for my guests, but not for the hosts. Right. We're looking at one of our other IT groups to help host our VMs, but 
they don't want to give us infrastructure as a service. They want to give us platform as a service, which we don't want. So. Uh huh. Because you want control. It's an interesting split. How many people are aware of the difference between the term infrastructure as a service and platform as a service? Okay, so that's it's good that that's starting to filter up, and that's a that's a that's a good point. I think that platform as a service is going to be awesome in the longer term. Platform as a service does a really bad job of dealing with any legacy app at all because, of course, they don't exist. <laughs> you know, when you wrote your whatever thing with C and the little hooks and a Python thing over here and the Perl library that you can't get rid of and, you know, the Java stuff that came from a company acquisition that sits off to the side and you've got the SOAP calls to it and all. That's not, that's not, yeah, that's not a platform as a service uh, compatible offering. <laughs> but that's all you got. And that's all most enterprises have got, right? So PaaS is fantastic in the startup world. Uh, and everyone loves it, right? Everyone's going Heroku and Engine Yard and whatever uh, and, and Cloud Bees and all these great PaaS offerings that allow them the promise of infinite scalability. Because when you're writing new code, you believe any promise in the world, <laughs> right? And, uh, and you have no legacy, right? The second you have real legacy is when your business starts having customers. And then you realize that every bit of code that you wrote that you intended to throw away is already legacy that you can't get rid of. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and it may be that when you're, you know, when you're, you end up locked into a certain uh, PaaS offering, uh, and that's fine, but it doesn't do anything for your legacy stuff, right? So, uh, uh, right. So that's that's what an IaaS platform does. Uh, are, you, and are you looking seriously at any of the, at, at the, any of the IaaS stuff at this point? No? Why not, I ask you? Why not, I say? We are the solution to your problems. Dr. Eucalyptus's snake oil is exactly what you need, sir. <laughs> It'll put hair back on your head and also more on your chest if you need it. Uh, Solve I, all your VM problems. I understand that. Um, <laughs> there's, there's some political stuff where two different IT groups. I am a, a, I work for university and we have our central IT group and I'm one of the individual college IT groups. Mm. So when we do stuff that duplicates what central IT does, which we already have quite a bit of overlap, they, right. they don't like that. And some of the cloud stuff, especially with Amazon, I'm concerned. It's not, not that I don't trust Amazon. The billing model of uh, pay as you go is sometimes very, uh, it, it can really hurt you in when oh the yeah when the state well when oh yeah it's it's not even that it you bill too much uh, here's an example of what happened um, I knew someone a new department they had the the least copier they would pay per page and that worked well except when the state budget freeze came down and you couldn't spend any money yeah. So now you have an academic department that could not make copies. I'm not kidding. <laughs> was, this was an admissions department. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So, you know, the it's more like, okay, you buy it outright and it's insurance. You know, you, you still right. got it when the, the bad times. Right, happen. that's right. And uh, and the and the funny thing about the Amazon model. Uh, I love you, Amazon, um, is that uh, you don't necessarily understand where the costs are. It's not like Amazon doesn't try to do a good job of representing those costs. They do. But the permutations of where you end up spending money, because you spend, it, you spend money on storage, you spend it on compute, you spend it on network throughput, right? And you spend different rates on net network throughput going from different place to different place, right? And actually having all of that stuff in your head modeled properly is surprisingly difficult and you think you understand what you're going to be spending and then suddenly three boxes the load hits 30 and you scale out to 10 boxes and the network spread is not what you expected and your bill is you know hugely different yes right have a set load so start again I don't see the advantage of Amazon um, for a normal business that has a set load, a set growth. I, I see the advantage of hyper growth web applications that one day they could get, they could get on Slashdot and have a million visitors in a few seconds. Right. That's advantage. But for my business, 
I got you know two VMware servers that are going to handle my load for the next three years. Yeah. So I don't. And once I buy those hardware, I don't pay anything else. You're right. You're exactly right. I'll disagree with you, Greg. I, I think that there's even a case there. Because when we look at IT projects over time, 60% of IT projects fail. And so I think the rapid provisioning abilities that you get with. Uh, I was trying to throw him a bone, brother. What? I was trying to throw him a bone, but yeah, I don't agree with him either. Uh, the, <laughs> the fact that it allows you to, to throw. Uh, to throw things together faster, provision them faster, means that instead of waiting eight weeks to get your hardware vendor to ship you hardware, spend a week getting it racked, provisioned, cabled. Right. You know, you do that in sub 15 minutes. Yeah, I, and, and in slow. fact, I would sort of turn, to, I, w I would actually turn around the model, the, the question, and say, you're not necessarily interested in, you know, on premise cloud, but I don't understand why, if you have that small growth model, why would you, why, why you would even buy hardware in the first place. What, what are you saying, lease it? No. No, I'm saying put those loads in the cloud. Why would you not put those loads directly in the cloud? Because the, the, the amortized cost of the hardware plus the maintenance of the hardware, uh, if you compare that to the cost of putting a similar workload on the cloud, have you done that math? Right now we have a two-year contract for crappy internet. And <laughs> we're paying out the wazoo, so I do not want anything that I could rely on that internet connection for. Right. Hosting it in hell, uh -huh. I can lose my internet connection and be fine. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Interesting. Because, you know, and, and service providers are, you know, they're going to they're gonna do that now because they're scared. You know, they're locking in customers all the time. Um, okay. uh, I've got a counterexample to, to your case. Are your customers coming through the, your crappy internet connection? Y'all talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to get some water. No, uh, I love I talks think, like this. Uh, I'm the only IT person in my company. <laughs> Okay, so your application, you, all your business is internal, all your traffic, you know, you don't need, you don't have customers coming into your network, you've got just, you know. Do you consider your developers to be customers? Do you consider your developers to be customers? So this, yeah, so this sounds like one of those cloud exceptions, right? When you've got a completely internal, uh, uh, and you need to be internal for security reasons, or? No, it's just, again, um, our IAC connection is each one, it's about 50 people. Mm. And so it saturates our network. Oh, so you've got external, uh, oh, right. so, okay, so yes. external bandwidth. Oh, right, so, OK, so yes, external bandwidth issues. So, <laughs> uh, pardon me, this is the India problem. So you are just like every Indian developer out there, same kind of the same kind of profile where, uh, for whatever reason, the full speed of the public internet doesn't quite reach you yet. So I didn't understand that, right? Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing a ton of interest in South Asia in private cloud because they keep hearing all this cool stuff about all the stuff that Amazon can do for them, but for them to actually get to Amazon is fairly ridiculous. So they want a version of something that, that looks kind of like Amazon locally. And so on our IRC channel, Pound Eucalyptus on Freenode, if you should ever feel like swinging by, uh, the number of folks who come in in the middle of the night when I'm trying to sleep and ask questions uh, has done a, a significant, uh, uh, it's sort of changed my schedule a little bit so I can be there to answer some of those questions. They're all from India. And they're for that reason, right? There's a ton of people trying to set up this uh, you know, self-managed infrastructure that they can use to deliver uh, uh, these services to you know, the people in their organization. Uh, and they can't get the real cloud, so they want to set up one of their own. Um, and I think it's, you know, and I think again, it's worth, it's worth uh, talking a little bit about what it means to be cloud, right? What, what cloud is. So talk a little bit about this because there are a lot of people saying a lot of things about what cloud is and isn't. And cloud is sort of, you know, it's one of these words. Here's the thing. When open source was young, people ignored it. And then it got to a certain level and everybody fought to define it, right? 
Well, we think that open source means this. What we think, well, we th when we think of open source, we think of shared source. Thank you, Microsoft. That's wrong, but okay. Um, and now we're, gonna, we're getting to the same place with cloud, right? Everybody wants to define what cloud is. So allow me to offer my uh, description of what cloud is. Um, first of all, it's self-service, right? You click a button that says, give me a computer now. Well, give me a server. Give me an instance. Give me a compute capacity. Click a button, boom, here's your SSH key, thank you very much, enjoy, right? So it has to be self-service to be cloud. Uh, it has to be scalable to be cloud, right? Uh, and scalable means uh, auto-scalable, which means APIs. So when you bring up that first server, you want the ability to say on that first server, first server, here's a script. And that script says, when your load hits 30, you start up a second server that looks just like you. Here's the recipe. When your load goes down to one or under one, you kill yourself unless you're the only server standing, right? So there's a little script. You, you, you put that in, and uh, when you get slash dotted, your server spawns servers until it can handle the load, right? So scaling, that's another fundamental piece of cloud. Um, and then metering. The ability to know how much you or any user has spent, right? So you want, and we call this chargeback, I guess. Some people call it metering, some people call it chargeback. It's the ability to say, uh, uh, you've spent too much. So pay us on your credit card or, you know, we'll turn you off, right? Um, in the public cloud, there's no such, there's no idea as chargeback, you just pay, right? Hey, you used 500 servers accidentally because your script went awry. You owe us $1,500 for yesterday, please. You know, oops, better check out that, you, know, you want that cost certainty? You better make sure that your auto-scaling scripts work really well, because if they don't, it could cost you. Um, but even in an internal cloud model, you know, when you have 50 uh, 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 nodes, that you're cutting up into VMs. You want to be able to say, okay, this department gets 10 of those nodes, and this department gets 10, and this department gets 20, and if you should run over, you know, we've got some flexibility, but we've got some rules and mechanisms that allow us to turn you on or off accordingly, right? That's what cloud is, at least at the infrastructure level. And if you are providing those services, you are providing cloud services, right? And if you're not providing those services, you're not providing cloud services, right? Um, there's a more detailed and smarter uh, explanation of this at uh, NIST, so they're the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they define what cloud is for the federal government. So if you want to go to, if you, if you want to sort of have a better understanding of what everyone means when they say cloud computing, uh, go to nist.gov and look for their cloud computing bulletins, and there's all kinds of good stuff there. By the way, they're a eucalyptus customer. <coughs> so there are a lot of services online like... Uh, Google Drive, for example, that uh -huh. they're like store your documents in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so, would you say that they're a cloud service because they uh, act like, like you say, internally, or would you say that doesn't really fit the definition of cloud? Well, I mean, it sort of does. It's self serve to, to me, it's not cloud computing unless the computing is being done in the cloud. So that's cloud storage service, but to me, that's not cloud computing, right? And I guess I should have been more clear. The cloud computing, I, uh, the cloud definition I gave you is not in fact the definition of cloud. It is the definition of cloud computing. So storage is not computing, hence those are not cloud computing uh, uh, examples. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Uh, You're going to be like Phil Donahue over here. Get that mic over there. Does anyone remember who Phil Donahue is anymore? Sorry. So I, I think that definition still holds true um, that you provided because, uh, you know, on demand, self service, scalable, and measurable, regardless of whether you're talking about platform, infrastructure, or software as a service, that's still that's still the co lowest common denominator yeah. between all three of those. Yeah. So, is Google Drive cloud? Well, it meets the definition. It's probably software as a service or maybe store, storage as storage a service. Storage as a but, service. Yeah, know. if it's cloud, if it has AAS after it, right? That's another way of telling if it's cloud. If it's something as a service, so zombies as a service, margaritas as a service, tacos as a service. 
Um, yeah, that's all cloud. Uh, all right, so I'll move on to, it's time to, it's time to go, it's, unless there are any pressing questions, it's time for me to go pure product pitch. Now's the time, get ready. Oh, yes. I actually distinguish between scalability and elasticity because... Right, fair enough. So I, I think you were referring to elasticity. Yeah, I'm, I'm referring to elasticity and auto-scaling. That's right. Um, although you, you sort of get manual... Scalability is sort of manual <laughs> elasticity, right? The ability, for the, the ability for the sysadmin not to have that API that auto-scales, but to say, oh, I think I just got slash dotted, push that button five more times, and five more VMs show up. Um, I think in terms of auto-scaling first, but you're quite right. The manual version of auto-scaling is also part of the scaling cloud idea. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of eucalyptus and uh, where we come from, what we've been doing, what we're doing now, what we're going to be in, doing in the, in the near future. Um, so uh, eucalyptus, this is uh, an acronym. Would anyone care to guess what that is an acronym for? Eucalyptus? It's a bunch of blah, blah, blah that's not even close. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> that was unfair. I shouldn't have asked. All right. It's a elastic utility computing architecture linking your programs to useful systems. Eucalyptus. Awesome. Yes, I deserve a big, big props for remembering that. That's, uh, uh, and How, that's a great question. Where's the mic for him? How long did it take for you to come up with that? Well, here's how it worked. The engineers, when they, so the, the project was started in 2007, I want to say, as a UC Santa Barbara research project under Professor uh, Rich Wolsky and his cadre of loyal graduate students. And uh, they hacked some code. They're like, we're going to make our own Amazon. Woohoo! And they hacked a bunch of code and hacked a bunch of code. And they got to a place where they're like, oh, this might actually do something. And we might want to make a company. Well, what will we call the company? Well, let's take a bunch of words that we think are representative. Uh, and then we are going to put those words into a program that one of these dudes wrote to go through and, and come up with all of the possible acronyms from all of these things. So systems and elasticity and utility computing. We're about utility computing. Is it, is it a platform? No, we think it's an architecture. So let's call it, let's put them all in. And eucalyptus is what came out, along with se maybe several other. See, this is the part of the story I don't actually know. What were those other choices? So uh, if someone is tweeting, someone treat, tweet Rich Wolsky and ask him what the other choices were, if I don't remember to do that, because I think that would be fascinating and a, a key part of uh, any presentation I would give. Um, so right, so uh, they came up with this software. It was awesome. It kind of worked. Uh, it was kind of close to Amazon at the time, and then two weeks later, Amazon released another feature, and it was already you know, three months behind or whatever. Because that's the way it's always going to be, right? No matter how good eucalyptus is, Amazon is always going to be ahead of us, and that's okay, right? Our, our job is to give a good enough subsection of services that is completely faithful to Amazon that you can rely upon, and if there are features you need in Amazon, you go get them from Amazon, right? Or you write them for eucalyptus and then give us the patches. That would be great. Um, where was I? Right. So. Uh, Formed a company in 2009 in Santa Barbara, uh, made the code base open source, the 1.5 uh, version, uh, released under the GPL. Uh, lots and lots of interest. I was at Red Hat at the time. I spent a decade at Red Hat before uh, I ended up at Eucalyptus, and that's another story. Um, and when I was at Red Hat, uh, one of the things that I was working on was the Fedora Cloud Special Interest Group. So I was, you know, and the reason we started the Fedora Cloud SIG was because, it's a complete tangent, but I, I like it, uh, was because we were trying to get decent Fedora images onto uh, EC2 because, and I don't know how, how many of you, you know, know the sort of guts of how EC2 works, but um, you've got... Uh, an Amazon kernel image, an Amazon RAM disk, and an Amazon machine images, right? So the AKI, the ARI, and the AMI. And the only thing that a customer has the right to upload is the AMI. 
So you can create all of your AMIs all you want, but they have to refer to existing AKIs and ARIs already in the system. So what that means is that you can take uh, uh, an image, remix it, save it, and, and that's your, your new image. But if the only kernel there is from, say, Fedora 6, then every machine image is going to be based on Fedora 6. And if you're at the Fedora project and you're seeing people trying to get uh, Drupal 6 and PHP 5 and all this stuff running on a Fedora 6 kernel, you're thinking, wow, we should really figure out how to get them the latest kernel. So we had a project in Fedora that, you know, its original goal was to figure out how to make sure that Amazon would update their kernels. Uh, and this is how I first found out about Eucalyptus. We started up the, the cloud special interest group and I started the mailing list and I said hello to everybody and said, hey, we're having a cloud party. And two of the first five people uh, on the mailing list were from Eucalyptus. So I thought, yay, awesome open source. Um, and uh, Eucalyptus ended up being pulled into a relationship with Canonical so that they were the basis of the Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, UEC. Anyone here have any familiarity with UEC, right? So Eucalyptus was the original base of UEC. Um, both growing companies, things get crazy. Uh, you know, we, we ended up uh, breaking up, uh, you know, and so uh, now we've, we've got a UEC kid that we have joint custody of um, and, and, you know, we, have visitation rights and so forth, and that's nice, it's civil. Um, they're nice people, but we both moved on. Um, and uh, uh, at about the same time, uh, we started getting customers, right? Like customers who were paying money. Uh, and we, they needed patches in a hurry. And so right around the time we released version 2.0, and this is a, this is an, and I tell this story because of this is how open source businesses evolve, right? And it's fascinating. Um, so we made a fork. And the fork had the open source version and the enterprise version, right? And the enterprise version had proprietary hooks to other things because customers immediately started saying, this is awesome, where's the VMware driver? And we're like, uh, we kind of haven't written it yet. Just write a VMware drop. There you go. Uh, but we couldn't give that out as open source because it's VMware. We didn't have the right to give that out as open source. We were using hooks in the, in, in the VMware API that are not available for open consumption. We can just give it out as part of our open source projects. So we made this fork. Uh, and we paid lots of attention to the enterprise fork because that's what the customers were asking for. And they're banging on us for new requests, right? So boom, 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 boom. Um, with the best of intentions of making sure that any patch that was an open source patch would get ported back over to the open source version tenants. Uh, well, as you do, you know, customers get angry, they demand more change. We ended up ma maintaining the EE branch and then a couple of more branches and soon we've got this whole EE infrastructure that is cooking, right? All kinds of codes going on there and we'd port over a patch maybe once a month, maybe once every three months maybe once a year, right? It doesn't take long for this before people start going, well, Eucalyptus was cool, but I guess they're dead. No, no, wait, no, look, we've got all these customers, really, because, no, but, well, you're not an open source company. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. You're right. So we sort of stopped being an open source company for a while, is the, is the upshot of that. This is before I came on, by the way. And this was my job, right? Because they knew it, they knew it, and they're like, look, we, we we're going to get back on the open source train. We pinky swear, and we need your help to do it. So I'm the, I'm the community guy now. Uh, and so they spent basically a year and a half splitting all this stuff back out. So Eucalyptus 3.1, which is on GitHub now. So if you go to github.com slash eucalyptus, you can see all the goodies, minus the actually relatively small delta of proprietary code that talks to those proprietary offerings. We actually split that out and firewalled it off so it's actually separate. Um, and the rest of it is all on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash eucalyptus, you'll see all of our code, including the eucalyptus code. Um, uh, and that's 3.1 beta, and 3.1 release will be sometime later this month. And we also have a product out there called Fast Start. So if you go to the eucalyptus.com site, you'll see the Fast Start for version 2.03. In a couple of weeks, you'll see the Fast Start version for 3.1, uh, where you can start up your own cloud in... I did it in 12 minutes. So your own private cloud, 12 minutes. 
you will probably take three hours the first time. That's okay. Um, come to the IRC channel and we'll help you through it. Um, you need, this is my kit, two laptops. Uh, one laptop, which is the front end, which is uh, the web interface, uh, the storage controller, uh, the cluster controller, uh, and all the bits that glue it together. And that's a bunch of Java and C code and so forth. Um, and then you have a node controller. And the node controller is the thing that scales up. So you basically have one front end and several node controllers. In my demo kit, which I didn't have today because it's at a Cloud Expo New York next week, and they're bigger than you are, so sorry. Um, so uh, you set up the node controller, then you set up the front end to talk to the node controller, and boom, you're up and running. Right? And you go to the, the front end and you say, give me virtual machines. Give me, start me two VMs. And it goes to its vast uh, number of NCs. It looks and says, tell me what NCs are out there in my data center. And the other little laptop says, I have four VMs for you. And it says, great, give me four VMs. Right? And that little thing looks exactly like Amazon does from the EC2 plus S3 perspective. Right? So if you run uh, you could describe instances, you will see a list of uh, uh, running instances. If you use you could describe images, it will give you a list of all of the images that are available in your availability zone, right? Um, uh, so yeah, fast start, so check it out. Uh, it's, uh, it's dead easy. Um, yes? Well, so yes, assuming you can actually move stuff out of your GovCloud, but yes, I mean, it all uses the same API. So this is, and understand this, working with the public cloud has a lot of caveats around it still, right? No matter who you go with, who is a private IIS infrastructure provider, there's still some gaps. But the tooling is the same and the machine image formats are the same. So that if you've got uh, an AMI on your public or your GovCloud instance, you can pull that image in in a, a large number of cases. Basically, just pull it right to the local S3 server. We call it Walrus. So our version of S3 is called Walrus. You pull that image from S3 to Walrus, and you launch it the same way you launch it there with the new, that's an AMI and has an AMI code. This is an EMI and has an EMI code, and they're different but you, you map between the two, and then you launch this, and boom, it's running, and it's exactly the same, right? Okay. So um, I, I ran into the issue about the, the kernel that you talked about. Right. Because um, the, the project that I'm working with, we want to handle, we want to create everything that we have. Right. So um, on GovCloud, the instances that they had, you know, were not built by us. So I built one on AWS, which is what we run there. Uh -huh. Then I tried, I ported that uh -huh. to the Gulf Cloud, and the porting worked great, but it would not boot up because the kernel that I use on the AWS side was not available on the Gulf Cloud. Right. So I know that I'm going to run into this a couple more times. So you're going to the reason, and this is this is actually an advantage for Eucalyptus because you can pull down whatever kernel they're running and run it on Eucalyptus, but you can't go the other way. Right. Okay. You have access to the EKIs and they're a part of the image bundling process locally. Yeah. You will never have access to the AKIs unless you're like a super uber customer or partner, right? Yeah. So in your use case, that difference between the two AKIs, it may be a problem where you just picked the wrong AMI or you picked, you picked the wrong AKI to boot to and it may not have been clear that the, the AKI over here is analogous to this AKI in GovCloud, which is probably the problem you ran into. Because they run a lot of Zen and they run different version of Zen in different places, from what I understand. Yeah. And they've got some mechanisms. Like I think right now they're moving towards a single kernel model where they basically have abstracted all of that away. But there's still a lot of images out there that are running old kernels, and you have that mapping issue. Okay. So where I was trying to get take my question to is, if I set up a eucalyptus um, EMI, would I yes. be able would I be able to just port that? Flawlessly into Gulf Cloud, because I'm not going to keep running into this. Yes, presuming that you're using a Zen-based NC. 
right? They've got Zen machine images. You need to be running Zen locally to make sure that you've got compatibility at the kernel level. Okay. Okay, so the, uh, the front end is one set of code, and then the NCs run different configurations depending on which one you choose, right? So this, this NC, and what the, and the NC is a node controller, and it basically, it's a C uh, uh, thing that manages all of the VMs on that machine for a particular VM profile, right? So this NC might be running KVM only. This NC might be running Zen only. These two NCs might be running the VMware broker, right? So you need to make sure that whatever AKIs and EKIs you're moving back and forth, you're using Zen on the NC that you're running this stuff on, right? So if I could try and define Eucalyptus just based on the things that you're talking about today, it's, uh, it, it lets you set up a hybrid cloud on Amazon with uh, self-service, automatic scaling, and uh, metering. Is that a So, right? kinda. It provides you, it definitely provides you with self-service. It provides you the opportunity for self-scaling and the opportunity for metering, and you gotta write some code to make it work better. Okay. But that's okay. We'll be getting farther than that in the coming releases, right? Auto-scaling right now is a feature that Amazon provides that we do not. So. But uh, you can do some pretty quick and dirty auto scaling that works really well, right? So, because the whole point is the API is what's necessary. The API to say, go start me another machine, start it under these criteria, stop it under these criteria. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, uh, auto scaling pieces uh, are, are, Amazon has some of those baked in for the most common use cases that will basically manufacture those scripts for you based on the arguments you give it. And we're looking to have that sometime the next year. Cool, okay, and uh, a second question. The, are, you were pointing to some people in here who um, have are competitors. So. Yes, CloudStack, so stand up CloudStack, say I'd hello. I'd like to hear from like, your thoughts about each other and like, what you guys are better suited for maybe. As soon as we get out of here, I'm gonna punch him dead in the face. <laughs> No, so, uh, yeah, funny thing. So we're both on the Gluster Advisory Board together, and we both sort of grew up together in Fedora, right? When I was the Fedora project leader, he was one of the first North America, I think, were you the first North America Fedora ambassador? I probably wasn't the first. I was the first that... You were the first one who did anything. <laughs> it's terrible. No, maybe Clint was the first one who did anything. But yes, yeah, so we've, something. you know, and we're both Fedora guys and have been forever, and yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so we, we both get along. Um, there's actually some conversations going on in both of our communities right now about code sharing um, because a lot of the things that we are trying to achieve um, are, are very similar. And so one of the beauties of open source is that we can both utilize those common parts. Um, some of the things that, uh, that differentiate us um, you know, we chose the alternate API, but we also support EC2, but it's certainly, uh, at the moment, it's a second tier player API for us. Um, and the second uh, issue is we, we focused early on uh, a, a beautiful GUI that, um, that honestly people don't use unless they're truly end users, they don't use long term. But it does a great job of selling the product. <laughs> it does, it looks, it looks. <laughs> and we are flashy. envious. Um, you know, we've, we've gone after uh, a lot of our early um, real heavy users were, were public providers who said, oh, Amazon's doing this, I want to sell something similar. And to hear Greg talk, they seem to be focusing on the uh, on private cloud. Yeah, it is, and it's pretty clear, and it's a pretty clear distinction between uh, 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 user customer segments as well, because the enterprise clouds have a different need uh, uh, than, than, the, than the, the sort of competitors to Amazon, yeah. right? Uh, it's different scale, different pieces of the puzzle are important. So yes, our focus right now is on enterprise on-premise cloud. Right, so, so ours tends to be public provider and that greenfield web scale company like the, the big gaming companies that, that behave very much like an Amazon but uh, yeah. just don't sell to outside customers or don't sell computing yeah. resources to outside customers. Yes, you might know them. You might know their customers, but they can't yes. say who they are. Like Lord you can't of the say cloud. who most of our customers are. Yes. So we're uh, so like two minutes. Is, is that two minutes and we're done, or two minutes plus questions, or like now we're like one minute? Because officially we're done at half past. 
All right. What time is it? Well, Greg, can I can I go back to your m workload migration? Yes. Do you actually see people moving, doing large scale moving of AMIs and and AKIs back we, and forth? Uh, so not huge scale, but in very particular cases, it's key. Yeah. So. I would actually think that, that they would have solved that with configuration management so that you effectively end at the same endpoint. Is, is that more common or less common? Or I think that different people have different reasons for doing it differently, okay. right? The, the chief reason for ripping, out, ripping a full image and moving it over is that once you cache that image, startup time of that image completely baked is like seconds. and. Post-configuration tools like Puppet or Chef or Ansible or something like that can take you quite a while depending on the relative complexity of the, of the, the workload, sure. right? So in those cases where they've got very well-defined workloads that seldom change, they absolutely use image portability all the time. Uh, uh, and we're seeing, you know, and we've only got a handful of customers who are really using that, largely because we're still working out some bugs on some of it. Um, but no, we're, and that, uh, we're working hard on making sure that that is rock solid. So I think we probably need to wrap up. Uh, so, but I'll be out. We'll, and we, if you have any questions, please come to me and follow up and ask, because I'll be here until everyone is done asking me questions, and then I'll drive home. Yeah, we do have a 15 minute gap from the next session. Okay. All right, take the mic when I'm done, when you need well, me to get out. As I say, we're officially done in a minute. All right. So, flowing. Where do you see, uh, to Where do you see uh, tools like guest uh, FS um, in, in this continuum? Uh, necessary for breaking into images and fiddling with them, certainly. Um, can't you apply automation and um, create baked images. Yeah, there's a lot of it. And there's going to be, and uh, right now, I'm not super happy with our tool story yet. There's a lot of good tools out there to do this kind of stuff. You know, GuestFS for going in, cracking images and, and, and fiddling with them is a tool that I know that some of our guys are using. Um, you know, when you've got the camp between baked and fried, right? You've got the folks who want an image and they want to crack that image, make very specific changes, and then redistribute that image, right? That's one family of folks, and they tend to use guest FS and associated tools. And then you've got the other folks, and I'm more in this latter camp. In my gut, I'm a recipe guy, right? I want to see how that image was made, and I want to see the provenance all the way from the Kickstart file that was, and remember, I'm a, a, a Red Hat, Fedora, RPM kind of guy. So uh, I want to see the Kickstart file that was used to create it, and then I want to see the post section that was used to put together whatever, lay down whatever bits for further systems management. And then I want to see the chef recipe or the puppet recipe or the shell script or the Ansible recipe that turned it into whatever it is, right? And I think those, two, those are the two sort of opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think that most sysadmins find themselves in all kinds of places midway through, right? Uh, on the recipe side of the world, I find that a tool that I really like to use is Box Grinder. So, uh, uh, you know, it's basically, uh, it's, it was written by some of the JBoss guys, and it does a really good job of uh, giving you that sort of all-in-one push button. I want an image that looks like this, and it basically sucks in a kickstart and builds you out an image in a number of formats. One of them is supposed to be a eucalyptus image as soon as we fix a couple of bugs and we got to, you know, but. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of tools out there. I think they're nascent. And I think that cloud is going to force those, those tools to maturity in a way that they've never really been forced to because cloud hasn't really existed before. Right? The existence of a real cloud world means that system management tools are going to be fundamentally changing and accelerating in a way that they never have because there wasn't enough shared knowledge to do it. Um, 
If you go to the Puppet channel, there's like, how many people are in the Puppet IRC channel? Like 1,500 or 2,000? It's ridiculous. So the amount of shared knowledge on system management configuration has just exploded. All right, if you need me, I'll be out there. Thank you. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. 
the most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago. Uh, and, you know, it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack.